Hi, and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Jennifer Mogan. She's an anesthesiologist, and she wrote the Kevin MD article, How Doctors Are Losing Money Every Time a Patient Pays a Bill. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? Absolutely. So I always wanted to go into medicine from the time that I was very young. Um, I took the very straight and narrow approach straight from high school to college at Colgate University, then back to my hometown of Rochester, New York for medical school. Um, I stayed there for anesthesia residency, and I've been here in private practice anesthesia ever since for the past 14 years. And when Mm -hmm. the pandemic started, I found myself struggling with the anxiety over being on the front lines in anesthesia. So I found I kind of needed to take a temporary step back from being in the OR and needed something to keep me busy and fill in the void. Um, And that's when I stumbled upon credit card processing through a very good friend who helped to found a female founded and run payment processing company several years ago. It's on a mission to bring a change to the world of credit card processing, to bring honesty, transparency to the industry, and it's certainly been lacking for years. And the more I learned about all these poor practices that go on, the more I was determined to be a part of that change Mm -hmm. and use what I've learned to help my colleagues and my neighbors and the businesses in my area to stop getting taken advantage of and put that five or 10 or $30,000 back in their pockets instead of in the processing companies, especially right now during COVID when every penny counts. So tell me a little bit about that transition into credit card processing. Were there some challenges in that transition? And did you have an interest in this field before you made that transition? I really knew nothing about this field before making that transition. And I really, it took me a long time to embrace the idea that I could and that it's okay to do something outside of and alongside of a clinical medical career. So I think it took a lot of soul searching and being okay with myself to um, embrace that. And once I was able to do that, I realized how much value I have to offer to my colleagues by sharing this knowledge with everyone. And that made that transition a little easier. And I do fully intend to go back to clinical medicine. I, I can't imagine leaving that behind, but it's nice to be able to do them both alongside each other. And before making that jump into the credit card processing field, did you have any prior training in the area? Absolutely not. Um, Being in medicine, I think we all kind of have our heads in the sand and and really don't understand most of this stuff. And, And honestly, the majority of business people and doctors in general don't understand the credit card processing industry. It's It's an industry that's very poorly understood, not very transparent at all. And so I think it's valuable to have that information and to be able to share that. All right. So let's talk more about that. And you wrote about that in your Kevin MD article, how doctors are losing money every time a patient pays a bill. Now, for those who haven't read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Yes, absolutely. So that's a great question. Credit card processing is, like I said, an industry that's really not well understood um, or really very transparent. And um, the the poor practices out there are mind-blowing when you really get into it and learn about the ins and outs of the industry. One of the key basic points to start to understand the concept is to understand what an interchange rate. So there's hundreds of different credit cards out there and each one has a different interchange rate or percentage and that's dictated by the card brand. So Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and Amex, they all charge a particular interchange rate. Now that rate varies on a scale from very low rates for debit cards, which we see a lot of in medicine with HSA and FSA, um, all the way up the ladder to a basic credit card, um, a rewards card, an Amex card, and all the way up to business and corporate cards, which can be well over 3% as compared to those debit cards, which are oftentimes less than 1%. Um, So after you understand that basic concept, you can start to look at all the other pieces of the puzzle in which your processing company um, is charging you. Like what pricing model are you on and what are your rates? What are the extra fees you're being charged? Are you in a contract? Are you being charged for PCI non-compliance? And I can go into a little detail about each of those and how to protect yourself and what you should know. 
I guess the first thing is the pricing models. Um, as I mentioned in the article, when you take into consideration the idea of the interchange rates, you can easily see how if you're being charged a flat rate, mm -hmm. um, like Square or Stripe or even a lot of traditional processing companies, um, how when you're charged the same for every transaction, those can quickly add up. So Square is typically 2.9 to 3.5%. Um, so when you're getting a large number of debit transactions for your HSA and FSA cards, um, you're really losing out on that, what we call regulated debit. There's another model out there called tiered pricing, which is used by a lot of banks. And it's essentially like three different flat rates where they just lump the different transactions based on the characteristics of the transaction into a different rate. And with this model, you're still not seeing the full advantage of those low rates. And so by far the most economical model out there is interchange plus pricing, which is basically wholesale pricing that's based off of those interchange rates. And usually that's the model that's going to be best for your bottom line. It's hard to know what kind of pricing model you're on just by looking at your merchant statement because merchant statements are kind of like reading a foreign language. Um, so if you have someone out there um, like myself who's able to look at your merchant statement, well, Personally, I don't. I sent it to the office and we have analysts who do. And they're able to look at what kind of pricing model you're on, as well as knowing what your rate is. And that, I guess, is the second important piece of the puzzle. How do you know how your rate compares? Mm -hmm. I mean, up until now, the payments industry has really been a free for all. And payment processors are kind of just crawling all over each other, trying to undercut the next one's rate. And then they just pad the bill elsewhere to make up the difference. There hasn't been a good measuring stick or a gold standard. Um, it's not like when you go out to buy a car and you have a published MSRP, you can mm -hmm. compare it to. So it's hard for physicians or business people in general to really know what your rate means. Lots of the poor practices out there revolve around this. They'll, they'll undercut the rate, like I said, and then pad the bill elsewhere, or your rates will creep up over time. And then you have to spend time calling and negotiating and renegotiating your rates. And none of us have time for that. Um, neither does your office manager. So not to mention the fact that if you have to negotiate for a better rate, then they're obviously not giving you their best rate up front. Um, and so the company that I'm working for is trying to combat all of that by using a rate card to establish fair rates and guaranteeing those rates won't increase. And by using this rate card, we are typically beating other rates 90% of the time. And as I mentioned, mm -hmm. sometimes those savings are really, really significant. And then after you understand what kind of rate you, are, you mm -hmm. have and how that compares, the other part of it is all of those extra fees that get added onto the bill. Sure. So the merchant statements often, you know, seven to 10 pages long with a laundry list of fees that you weren't ever informed about, or they might just be posted quarterly or annually so that, you know, the processing company is banking on the fact that you're less likely to notice them um, if you do look at your statement. People get tied into contracts and leases and, and all these other things. PCI compliance um, is, I guess, the, the last big thing I wanted to talk about. And PCI is kind of like having to deal with HIPAA mm -hmm. um, uh, for credit cards. So there's standards that are meant to protect you and your customers from fraud and data breach. Um, you have to do yearly paperwork to make sure you're PCI compliant or else you get charged a fee. And the important piece of that is that your processing company actually gets a piece of that fee as well. So there's no incentive for them to keep you PCI compliant. And I've seen those fees as high as $125 a month. I've also seen it double dipped where there's an annual compliance fee of $120 or, and then a PCI compliance fee of $20 a month, presumably for helping to keep you compliant. And then also a PCI non-compliance fee of $20 a month. So make sense of that. <laughs> so if I'm a private practice clinician or if I'm within a private practice group, what's the most common situation when it comes to credit card processing do these groups find themselves in? What are some common default scenarios? So a lot of people default to using um, their bank, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily the best route to go because the bank still has to have a processing company. Um, and that's also not their pri the bank's primary way of earning money. So they don't have um, a lot of incentive to have a good program for you. So a lot of the times people will just go with your ba their bank because it's the easiest method and they don't ask questions. They don't 
get comparisons. They don't know what to ask or how to compare. Um, and that I think is the biggest problem that people fall into. The other thing is a lot of um, smaller practices as they're getting started, especially now with the pandemic, with a lot of um, you know, online virtual thing mm -hmm. with um, direct patient care, um, people are turning to Square um, mm -hmm. or Stripe or PayPal because it's easy to set up. But it's important to know that um, Square, Stripe and PayPal are what are known as merchant aggregators. Um, so when you are under the umbrella of one of those companies, you are under the same umbrella as every other merchant using that company. So you do not have your own merchant account. It's just like if you and everyone else in your town went out and opened a bank account together, mm -hmm. you are all under the same umbrella. And that becomes an issue, especially like at the beginning of the pandemic, Square withheld um, up to 30% of funds from many of their merchants because they were anticipating a large number of chargebacks. Um, and especially at the beginning of COVID, that was not the time to withhold funds from a merchant. So you can run into those sort of problems using those companies. You feel like they're big, they're well known, they're established, they're looking out for you. They typically are not. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say if I'm an established private practice and I just wanted to look further um, into which credit card processing option I have and where can I optimize this? So like, I guess where can, um, you know, where can that physician or clinician or office manager, where can they get started? Our company offers what we call a free payment checkup. Um, and that's where we find out some information about your business. We get a copy one or two months of your merchant statements. And then our analysts put together a comprehensive comparison for you using our rate card as your comparison. So you have a standard to look at. Um, and then we share with you that information on a side-by-side -side comparison. So you can see exactly if you are receiving fair pricing um, and the service that you deserve and everything that you need. 90% of the time, like I said, we're able to show that there's areas for improvement. 10% of the time we'll come back to you and say that you are receiving fair pricing and that you have a good setup. And if you're happy with your setup and your service, then we recommend you stay with what you have. And that's unique in the industry. Most companies are just willing to try to get the business no matter how they can. For a typical practice, how much do you think that they can save by delving into credit card processing practices and, and optimizing that? It's, that's a very hard question to ask because it's specific to the um, business, but I'll have to tell you personally of all of the analyses that I've done, um, it's been anywhere from being, you know, zero savings, you know, they already have a fair processor and fair rates, um, all the way up to I've seen as much as $30,000 a year savings from their credit card processing. We're talking to Jennifer Mogan. She's an anesthesiologist and she wrote the Kevin MD article how doctors are losing money every time a patient pays a bill. Jennifer, um, you know, we talked a little bit about private practices and how credit card processing affects private practices, but the vast majority of physicians, they work for large academic hospital systems. Do you see the same situation happening with larger conglomerates as well, that they themselves are not getting fair deals when it comes to credit card processing as well? Honestly, I can't speak to that. We typically deal with smaller to medium sized businesses. Usually those larger companies are um, established in some sort of bigger system that is servicing them. So I really can't speak to that, unfortunately. And if a clinician or office manager just wants to just find out more about this industry and maybe you pique their interest in terms of delving into their statements and credit card processing companies, what are some resources that you could recommend? Absolutely. You can feel free to reach out to me um, on my Facebook or LinkedIn page for um, Jennifer Mogan. Um, you can click on the link for this article. I'd be happy to talk more to anyone. As far as beyond that, look at your statement, mm -hmm. look through your fees, be informed, be knowledgeable. And as far as who out there to trust, I don't know. <laughs> Besides, besides myself, there are some good processing companies out there, um, but you just don't know unless you look. And uh, my final question, what's your take home message that you want to share with the Kevin MD audience? Be informed and learn something new every day. I think be it a piece of knowledge, a new skill, someone's name in your workplace that you didn't know before. Um, I think every piece of information that falls into our lap can 
enhance your life, can help you out in some way. And I've been very fortunate to learn something new that has helped myself, my colleagues, and hopefully a lot more people out there. Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you very much.